because I can't tell you how many times we go into a meeting that was set up by an adult child, for instance, that says, you know, mom's ready to move. Can you come over and talk to us about it? And we get there and mom's not ready to move. Uh, well, what made them think that, right? <laughs> so we have to put our real estate hat aside and put on our coaching hat and sort of coach mom through the process of even thinking about it. So that's who we are. Um, I'd like to have the panelists uh, introduce themselves, but Laura, did you want to add anything before we start the introductions? No, I think you did a um, great job and I'm looking forward to hearing from everybody and, and getting things started. All right. So why don't we start with uh, um, Laura Nash and Laura, what we're looking for is uh, your name, your organization, your role, and a little bit about your background. Sure. Thank you, Jan. I'm happy to be here today. I'm Laura Nash with West Financial Services. I'm a financial advisor. And I have worked since I was in high school, so just a couple of years. <laughs> and I have a varied background. I've had my own business. I've worked for large and small companies and um, also part of the sandwich generation. So um, with older parents and relatives, I certainly understand what it's like to work with people of all different ages and helping them get a better handle on their finances. And don't you have a specialty uh, based around serving women? Yes, yes, I do. My focus is especially on serving women. Um, women, I feel, have been underserved historically um, in the financial services industry. So yes, that is my passion. And I take the extra time to make sure that my clients feel educated and knowledgeable um, about their money. That's great. Thank you, Laura. Let's move to Antonia. Hi, uh, my name is Antonia Cummings. I with Joseph Goller's son's funeral home in Washington, D.C. Um, I am a licensed funeral director, but I specialize in pre-arrangements for families that are looking to make things easier for their loved ones, make sure that their wishes are fulfilled, and make sure that they are able to financially have the funds necessary for when that event does happen. Um, this is something I'm very passionate about, given the history of the last couple of years with COVID seeing a lot of families not having a plan in place and not having people to fulfill that plan. So thank you, Jan, for having me on to um, help educate in that department. Thank you for being here. Lindsay, you are next. Hello, my name is Lindsay Warrens and I am with Willow Legal Group. In our firm, there's two attorneys here. We focus on working with um, primarily parents of minor children and then also with older adults. So that is a lot of education on estate planning. Um, what does it mean to have a comprehensive estate plan to begin with? What documents do you need? Um, how to set that up to make things as easy as possible if something, you know, for your family, for your minor children, if something should happen to you. But then we also work with um, seniors and my partner does primarily elder law. And we talk, you know, we, we offer um, assistance with what documents do you need in place in that kind of um, scenario for the older folks. Also with, um, you know, how to, how to pay for care should, should you need it, what kinds of things, strategies around that, and then logistics of just how to get that done. So we kind of work with all ages and different um, different capacities, but like everybody else, we are passionate about helping people understand why they need a plan, what's included in those types of plans, and just educating them around you know, how to make a plan that will actually work for their family to make things as easy as possible when you, know, you do pass or if you need long-term care, things like that. Wonderful. Again, thank you ladies so much for being here. This is really great information. This is one of our most popular topics actually, and it's usually jam-packed with content and questions from our participants. Please feel free to unmute and ask questions as we go or pop your questions in the chat as we go along. We'll certainly also make time at the end for, uh, for Q&A. So let's dive right in. Um, first question, how important is it for you to collaborate, each of you, when making a comprehensive plan for a client and how does your work dovetail? Who'd like to start with that? I can start. Um, so it's incredibly important that we all work together. Um, it's like putting pieces together in a puzzle and in order to really get the full picture, 
and the full benefit of all of our expertise, it's important that we do work closely together. Yeah, and I think one of the things we like to do is, is once we have created a plan with a family, then we will work with their financial advisor to make sure beneficiaries are set up properly to make sure that we've addressed any potential tax issues that might exist. And, you know, just to make sure everything fits together. Um, but then, you know, on the planning piece with like Antonia, a lot of people want to have prearrangements. And so incorporating those into their estate plan is incredibly important so that it can get, um, those wishes can be honored. And we do that in a couple of different places within the estate plan. So working together to kind of make sure it all matches is really important. And Antonia, I know you play a big role in this process, even though, you know, pre-planning is not something people typically want to think about, but it's a necessity. Um, mm -hmm. Can you speak to that and, and you know, how, how it plays out financially and legally and who handles what? Absolutely. So like Jan said, this isn't a topic that a lot of people want to work with. Um, it Sometimes it's easy to kind of look for absolutely everything else that you can work on, except for this. It's like the broccoli on your plate. You leave it for last. Um, and <laughs> I completely understand that. So when I have clients come to me, um, I try to come at it from the perspective that you're doing this, not just for the sake of your own wishes, but for the sake of the people that you love. And when I have those people who do come to me first, I truly believe in a holistic plan. So I'm always looking for people like Laura and Lindsay that I can refer my families to because without all of it, it's, it truly is not a full circle of protection. You only have one piece of the pie if you're only doing one of these things because they really do all tie together. And a lot of people will come to me and say that they have their will done and their wishes are all documented and they, they have who's going to get what financially, but there isn't really a lot of planning that goes into how that's going to be fulfilled. And a lot of the times it's because you've gone on legalzoom.com and you think you have everything done because you've put together a will that AI has helped you develop. And the reality is while AI is a great tool, it can cause a lot of holes and a lot of um, breaks in that circle of protection if you're not necessarily looking at this from a unique and holistic perspective. So I always try to meet with families and tell them, okay, that's great. This is what you want. Here's how we're going to make it happen. And here are the, the lovely people I'm going to put you in touch with so you can finish that plan. And I can definitely give examples of how that goes into place as we move along through the slides. But that's my, um, my TED talk for the moment. <laughs> But thank you so much. Yeah, it's really important to be thinking about all aspects of this. So we'll dive right in with a question we get a lot on this seminar, and that is, what happens if something goes wrong with my account? And of course, they're referring to financial accounts, investment accounts, that sort of thing. What protections are there for the clients and how do you keep information secure? And that may be best addressed by you, Laura Nash. Sure. So, you know, especially over this last year with Silicon Valley Bank going under, it has certainly heightened people's awareness of their bank accounts specifically and what types of protections are in place. So we know that the government through the FDIC will basically protect and guarantee accounts up to 250000 and depending on how your accounts are titled, you can have multiple accounts depending on how they're titled that are each up to 250,000, but still be protected. So that is something definitely to consider. Accounts that are in um, an investment um, firm, such as a Fidelity or Schwab, they're also protected by another organization called SIPC which has a much higher limit. And also many companies will have additional insurance because no one wants to be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So if you do have any concerns, reach out to your financial institution and ask them specifically, but they do have various methods in place. As far as your information, you should never be sharing your personal information with someone that you don't know. Um, my mother recently got a call from someone who said they're shipping her um, 
um, some type of medical equipment, which she doesn't need. They had all of her information. So she thought that they knew her, but they didn't. And so she was totally fooled because they know how to get you on an emotional level. So definitely be careful on who you share your information with. We always send information out in a secure manner through a secure portal. Um, so we're ultra careful. So again, just, just be careful. Yeah, that's very good, good information. And, and, uh, and I know in our industry in real estate, when it comes time to close on a home, typically the buyers will be wiring their money to the title company for the settlement mm -hmm. versus bringing a check like in the old days. And scammers will hack into the email accounts of people involved in a real estate transaction. And the buyer could get an email that looks authentically like the type, like it's from the title company they're working with, with instructions on where to wire the money. So we have every one of our clients, whether they're buyers or sellers, sign a disclosure about the scam just so that they're aware of it. Because if you get an email like that, regardless of what kind of transaction you're in, when you get an email from someone asking you to wire money, definitely pick up the phone and call that person, not using the number on the email, but using the number you had for them to verify that it really came from them and verify the account number. There have been people scammed out in the real estate world, at least scammed out of hundreds of thousands of dollars with that scam. So it's, it can be scary out there. Yeah, so and you can't you get it back. No, you can't get that back. That's true. So in terms of when you're preparing to sell a home, what documentation issues can create issues? Um, uh, we'll talk about Maryland non-resident withholding a little bit, but um, Lindsay, in, in terms of, you know, trusts, estates, other types of uh, the way a property is titled, for instance, what are the things to think about? Um, number one is making sure the deed has <clears throat> is titled properly. Um, I actually have, I just got a client that retained me. Um, she owned a house with her dad since the 80s. And she said, you know, she thought they owned it jointly, which they did. He passed away in 2015 and she opened a small probate estate for him, didn't list the house because she thought it was hers. Well, then she went to sell the house and the realtor said, you don't own this house. You only own 50% of the house because it doesn't have joint tenants on it. So now we have to reopen the estate, probate her dad's half just mm -hmm. so she can sell this house that will end up being hers anyway all because it looks like they did the deed themselves. So um, making sure deeds are titled properly is huge. Um, but also if you have a trust and everything is fine with a trust, like it's, it's legal and accurate, you shouldn't have any issues selling property with it. Um, I do know with an example of just taxes, you have to make sure if there are any special tax exemptions on the property when you sell it after the administration of an estate, you need to make sure those taxes get paid back. Um, so that's one issue that people, I think, don't necessarily think about. They're like, oh, I'm inheriting this property. It's tax free, but it's not necessarily tax free. So. Um, and then uh, if it's an estate, you have to set up a separate account for the estate for the flow to and and from. Correct. Yeah. And you should have, I mean, a trust as well, there should be a separate trust account. Um, but yeah, those, that the money then goes back to the estate. It doesn't go directly to the beneficiaries. It has to go through the whole court process and, um, that can be time consuming. And that's part of the same client that I was talking about. She was under the impression. I said, well, we can, you know, we can sell the house during the probate process, but you can't take your dad's half of the money until it's done even though it's yours, you can't have it yet. And so that actually kind of threw her for a loop because she didn't realize, like she was counting on that to pay for a new house. So, right. you know, just little things like that, that um, people don't realize when it comes to property. Could you elaborate a little bit on the probate process, uh, what it is, how long it takes? Oh, Can, yes. Is it really complicated like everybody thinks it is or is it you know. Um, so yes and no. So the probate process is it's a court process. So somebody passes away, if their assets are not held in a trust, anything in your own name has to go through the probate process. And the court appoints somebody as your personal representative, also known as an executor. And if you have a will, it's usually the person that you have named in your will. If you don't, then there's a priority list of people who can serve in that capacity. It just depends who, who files the petition. 
So once that person is appointed, um, it's their job to gather all of your assets and report to the court. There's a notice that goes out to the creditors if you have any unsecured creditors stating that you've passed and they have six months to file a claim against your estate. And then if there's any property that needs to be sold, all that has to happen during the probate process. Um, the personal representative also has to file an accounting every six months and just it details what's come into the account, what's gone out of the account. And overall, the process takes an average of 12 to 18 months, even for like a simple estate. The fees generally range from two to 5% of your gross estate value. So for many people, if they've been in their home for a long time, they don't have a mortgage or they have a very minimal mortgage, and it's based on that gross value of the estate. So that's how they calculate fees. Um, and that can be court fees, personal representative fees, attorney's fees, all the fees. Um, once everything is done, then it gets distributed to the beneficiaries. Um, is it complicated? I think one of my clients, and I've totally stolen this description, described it as mysterious. And it is that is the best description that I've ever heard for probate. Because while, yes, there are rules, even for someone like me who does probates regularly, I will get notices from the court that I'm like, what is this? What do you want? So it's very it varies by who's reviewing it. What county are you in? It's it is mysterious. So it can be time consuming. It can be stressful. It can be a lot of work. Um, so it just depends. So complicated, maybe, but mysterious is really my favorite word for probate. So here's the big question. How do you avoid it? Oh, and wow. <laughs> there are several ways. Um, the most effective way is transfer everything into a revocable living trust. And that's where you transfer your assets into the name of the trust so that when you pass away, you as an individual don't own anything. Your trust owns everything. And the court doesn't have jurisdiction over that trust. So you don't even have to go through probate. Everything can just be handled quietly through family or just you know, a, a, a state administration attorney. And it's, it's a much smoother process. Um, other ways are making sure that you have um, beneficiary designations on all of your accounts. So you can do that with bank accounts. You can do that with obviously retirement, life insurance, any account that you can add a beneficiary to, the beneficiary will get the asset without the court, unless it's a minor. Don't ever name minors. Um, and then the other one is just jointly owning property. As long as it's in the right way, <laughs> then you can avoid probate court and it goes automatically to the other owner. So bank accounts, real estate are the most popular for those. And I believe as a as an executor or personal representative, you're you're going to be receiving what's called a letter of administration from the courts. Mm -hmm. You can manage any of the assets or sell a home, for instance. Yeah, that's what gives you the legal authority to act on behalf of the estate. Okay. Yeah. If you don't um, have that, you can't... go ahead. So Sorry, if you don't no. have that, then nobody will talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> And I wanted to bring up the uh, the topic of Maryland non-resident withholding tax on the sale of real property. Um, and, and this is specific to the state of Maryland. If you own a property in Maryland, but you've moved out of state, say you have a second home in Florida and you've retired and, and you've decided to move to Florida to your second home and make that your primary residence, but you've not yet sold your Maryland home, you could be subject to an eight and a half percent Maryland non-resident withholding tax on the profit. So before you change your state of residence, uh, you, you might want to consult a professional in terms of your tax obligations, because that could be a big hit. Um, so just wanted to bring that up, timing on changing the address and so forth. So, all right, moving along. Um, Laura Quigley? Oh, we've talked, <clears throat> we started to talk a lot about these things, but I think we should dive in and talk a little bit about more. What, what are these documents? Um, like a little bit more about the trust and the power of attorney. One thing that we see often that happens is, um, not often, but it has happened where family members were like, well, mom has passed away, but I'm her power of attorney, so I can handle everything. Anybody want to jump on that? <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> exactly. um, um, so your power of attorney dies with you. So it is a legal document that allows others to act on your behalf while you're still alive. There's different types of powers of attorney. Um, and 
I don't, you guys can tell me, I've been noticing in real estate where if you're, somebody's going to sell using a power of attorney, they do a separate limited power of attorney just for that transaction. Even though another general power of attorney is valid, I've kind of noted, and I don't know if that's to kind of prevent scams and unauthorized use, but um, there are different types of powers of attorney, but they are only while you're living. Trusts, on the other hand, you are going to name a successor trustee. And if something happens to you, if you become incapacitated or you pass away, then your successor trustee can manage any of any of your assets that are in the trust. Mm -hmm. So that's the catch. Sometimes like so when we do um, estate plans, we give you both because sometimes you have matters that are not part of the trust. And so your successor trustee cannot deal with that. So you need the power of attorney to have them deal with a non-trust asset or issue. And there are different reasons for that. But you, you, most cases, if you have a trust, you also are going to have a power of attorney and they're kind of used for different purposes. You're wearing different hats. I just want to ride the power of attorney thread of conversation for a moment, because to your point, Lindsay, like the definitions of power of attorney and what they're good for is so they're so diverse. And I have so many families and friends, especially come in to funeral homes before and after someone's passed away and say, I have power of attorney. I'm here to sign off on my friend's cremation. And the reality is that power of attorney does end at death. And if you have no blood relationship to someone, um, even if they don't have anybody, then that person automatically becomes a ward of the state until the court can deem whether or not this friend is in some way documented enough to be allowed to authorize someone's final disposition, regardless of whether their will says they want to be cremated or that this person is mentioned as the executor of the estate. Power of attorney, executorship, none of that has anything to do with your disposition, rights. And if you don't have the proper power of attorney prior to a death occurring, you can't make the arrangements for someone either. So making sure you have the proper designation to authorize someone's right of burial or cremation or making sure that um, you have the proper form showing that as a friend, you trump the relationship of the next of kin that maybe is no longer in contact with that person anymore is, is very important. And I know a lot of estate planning lawyers do a medical directive, which will say that someone wants cremation. Um, but if it doesn't have the proper designation on it to authorize X person to authorize that cremation, unfortunately, we're not able to move forward with the cremation until the court has deemed it appropriate. So it can be really upsetting for a lot of people. And I'm sure that if the person were alive and aware of the situation, it would be very upsetting to know that their wishes can't be fulfilled. So that's something I just like everyone to know when it comes to power of attorney paperwork, it does end at death and it does not allow you to authorize your disposition. Yeah, that's very important. And, and, you know, you think about the fact that if you have all this lined up before you leave this world you'll know that your family is burdened with less, you know, they're already going to be grieving, but then to have to deal with some situations like that, that make it quite unpleasant is not fun. Laura, you had your hand up. I mean, uh, uh, um, yeah, Laura Nash. Yeah. So just to um, add to the conversation about powers of attorney, um, some financial institutions will accept um, a power of attorney document from an estate attorney or other source. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them may require um, a client to complete that financial institution's own power of attorney form. So just something to be aware of. So Laura, that's, is that something people could plan ahead of time? When, when they're creating their powers of attorney, check with their financial advisor to find out, you know, what institutions they're investing with, what they require. Would you recommend that? Absolutely. It's definitely a good question to ask. Yeah. And just another good point to go along with that. A lot of different places have their own policies. Mm -hmm. So um, different funeral homes have their have different policies, depending on the state that they're in, different financial institutions. And I'm sure that you could fight a financial institution and say this power of attorney is valid, but do you really want to litigate that? You know, so the point is, you know, plan ahead. So mm -hmm. And uh, Antonia, I was going to say, I think, and we talked about the planning ahead. 
in today's society, so many of us are spread all over the country. We don't live close to our loved ones, um, but we may have a plan for there's a family plot somewhere. Do you recommend people make those plans ahead of time because you're maybe working in different jurisdictions or have to, you know, move your loved one to another state? Yeah, that's a really good question, Laura. And that's something that has really risen in the last 20 years, even internationally. Um, we are doing a lot of coordination with foreign funeral homes to get people to their homeland or getting them back from a vacation. Um, so obviously something like a death occurring while on vacation isn't something anyone plans on, but there are ways that you can kind of counteract that tragedy, almost like um, accidental insurance policies. You don't plan on a tragic accident, but you have them set in place in the event it does happen. So regardless of whether you are intending to have your body sent to another state or country, or you just want to be protected in the event something were to happen unexpectedly while traveling, um, funeral homes do have those kind of plans in place and ways of coordinating with foreign and domestic funeral homes and are able to get all that necessary paperwork from embassies or state departments. Um, and there are ways to protect against those expenses without having to flip out $20,000 for an unexpected ship out or something like that. So financially and emotionally, it is very helpful to make plans for those kind of unexpected events, or if it's already known that it's going to be needed, um, planning so that you are protected from inflation rates by planning ahead. Does insurance cover any of any of that? It does not. No. Um, I mean, you can use your life insurance benefit towards those costs, but there is not a specific insurance for funeral costs other than um, purchasing a prepaid funeral arrangement through a funeral home where they hold the money in a policy so that they can guarantee the costs. But it's not true life insurance or funeral insurance per se. It's a way of holding the money in a protected policy so that the funeral home cannot launder the funds and has a means of guaranteeing the cost for the entirety of someone's life. Right. And then um, guardianship in the case of incapacity. And does anyone would address that? Um, just in general, guardianship is when, so if you become incapacitated and unable to manage your own affairs, um, if you don't have powers of attorney in place, healthcare directives in place, it may become necessary to go to the court and have the court appoint someone as your guardian. And these can be very difficult um, cases. It is court, so that brings its own special um, sense of complication and stress. But if it's contested where maybe one family member thinks that the person is you know, incapacitated and another doesn't, you can imagine what that would be like as far as conflict and the costs of litigation and getting attorneys involved. And the other part of that is, you know, you are the un incapacitated person. And so you are not making the decision as to who you would choose. So if you can do that ahead of time um, by having a power of attorney, healthcare directive, you can put in those documents who you, you would choose should that ever happen so that you have you have the you've made the choice and it's it's not left up to the judge who's a stranger they don't the judge doesn't know you and it's just whoever comes forward um to you know act in that role so it's really important for you to have those documents in place before there's a question of whether or not you have the capacity to actually make those documents I was just curious about something. Uh, we talked about having a successor trustee. Mm -hmm. uh, do you recommend having a, a substitute to that trustee? As, you know, say that person becomes incapacitated, then what happens? Yeah. So we, in our, in all of our trusts, we ask our clients to choose at least three people. So they they name a successor trustee, and then two other backups. We also give the trustees the authority to appoint their own trustee. So if it becomes too burdensome, they can then say, well, there's nobody named behind me. So I'm going to go find somebody else that could manage this trust. That way, our goal is to always never, you know, to never have that role blank um, because then you would. Oh, dear. Oh, 
Who's frozen? Lindsay's frozen. <laughs> okay. At least it's not all of us. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully she'll come back online. Um, I think we've <laughs> talked about the role of the personal representative uh, yes. in our previous slide. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about aging in place. Oftentimes people, you know, uh, their intent is that they want to age in place. I think I think it's something like 80% of people interviewed plan to age in place and about 85% people do not end up aging in place. So what sort of um, documents, um, well, we've been talking a lot about this, would you guys recommend that people need? Or is Lauren that Ash, just that? Sure. Um, so we talked a bit earlier about some of these documents um, as far as having the, you know, healthcare medical directive, um, you know, beneficiaries. I think it's not only important to have these documents, but also to communicate with whomever you have named on these documents that they know that you have um, named them. Also make sure that they would be willing to step up in, the, in, ca in case something does happen. So it's important to communicate these documents and make sure that others have copies of them Mm -hmm. As we spoke about the other day, too, it's not a good idea to have them in a safety deposit box um, yeah. because, uh, you know, your loved ones or whoever you may have named may, may not be able to access them. So we always recommend giving copies to family members, friends. In some cases, it could be your estate attorney so that copies are available in case they're needed. Um, where should you keep your um, original copies of your documents? Lindsay, do you want to address that? Sorry. Oh, there's yeah. <laughs> My internet kicks me out. What yeah. was the question? I said, um, in terms of the, your, the important documents that you've created, um, where should you keep the originals and, and where should you not keep them? Um, what would be the <laughs> around that? <laughs> um, I will tell you where not to keep them. Do not keep them in a safe deposit box. Um, that requires a court order to get into if you are not able to get into them. Um, we generally either suggest keeping your will in a fire safe box um, with, you know, with someone you trust, you know, in their possession, you can leave, you can um, file it with the court for safe keeping for five dollars um, or we will keep it the other documents a copy is considered as good as the original so we just recommend you keep it somewhere safe and let people know where it is would you recommend like handing copies out to your family members that have roles um for definitely for your health care agents mm -hmm. um ours of attorney, not necessarily, because those can be used whether you are incapacitated or not, and somebody could totally clean out your bank accounts or, um, so those we recommend hanging on to unless you want somebody to need, you know, if you need them to actually do something, then give them a copy. Mm -hmm. But um, of course, it's, it varies too. Like we might tell one client, go ahead and give this to your adult child who's already been doing everything. It kind of varies on situation, you know, but in general, um, healthcare directives definitely need to be shared with the people who are listed on them. Okay. And, um, and I'm sorry, Lindsay, when you got, you got dropped off, we started talking about, are there certain documents if people are planning to age in place, is there anything mm -hmm. unique that they need to do um, with their documents? Um, so sometimes we will add specific language to some of the powers of attorney or healthcare directives to address uh, whether they need Medicaid planning, um, allowing the power of attorney agent to make changes to the estate plan or whatever to address that kind of situation. So it's kind of a case by case. So there might be times when we um, add additional language. But otherwise, as long as you have, you know, your incapacity documents and everything's set up and they're accessible, then you should be good. Because it sounds like, I mean, that there's a 
a core documents that sh you should have together and it doesn't matter how you plan to age. It, you need yes. to have these together to make sure your family understands or your loved ones what you want. Is that correct? Yes, I think, yes. you need, you want to have health care directives, powers of attorney, Attorney and some kind of a will, whether it's a very basic will, whether it's a con you know more complex, whether it's a trust. Even if you do a trust, you still have a will. So those are the three documents. Um, but the other thing that we want to stress with people is talk to your family. We hear all the time, like my parents won't tell me what they want. My parents won't tell me where anything is. They don't want to talk about it. That's the key: is talk about it so that they know what you want, and there's no question. Right. And also we've seen it on the other side um, where the kids don't want to hear it. So yeah. it's a tough conversation. That, yeah. You know, um, you know, conversation that needs to have in families, you know, as, as mm -hmm. children, adult children, you need to give your parents the grace to explain that to you, even though you don't want to hear it, you know, type thing. And, and also <laughs> the parents do need to explain it. So our next slide talks a little bit about um, something you just mentioned. And that was, again, talking about trusts. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk, I mean, I think we talked a little bit about this with property, but, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages of putting the property into a trust, you know, prior mm -hmm. to um, needing to sell the home? And a related um, question before you answer, maybe you could, you could add this onto your answer. In terms of um, selling real estate uh, in this situation, do you have to have the entire trust document, just pieces of it? Does it have to be original? Well, what is the settlement company going to ask for? Um, I would say it depends on the settlement company and whether they have lawyers on staff or not, <laughs> whether they understand trusts. Um, but so in Maryland, um, there is a document called a certification of trust that is supposed to function. It's two pieces of paper. It is supposed to function um, as a replacement kind of for the trust. And financial institutions or whoever are supposed to accept that document to prove there is a trust, here are the trustees, you know, as one or two signatures required. And that is supposed to be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Very, very few places actually will just accept that. And again, you're not going to sue them to take it. You're just going to give them what they ask for. So in general, um, I think the settlement company is going to tell you what they need. They're looking to see, does the trust exist? Is the property in the trust? Um, who has the authority to sign the contracts? Who are they putting on the deed? Uh, I used to work in a settlement company. So this is what we were looking for is, you know, who has the authority to actually complete this transaction? So you probably don't need to give them the entire trust. You'll need to just give them the sections that pertain to that. So um, they don't certainly don't need to see how your children are going to inherit your assets, <laughs> but they want to know who who has authority? So those are the um, those are the sections they'll want. The main, I think the main advantage of putting your real estate in a trust is probate avoidance. In Maryland, that's the only way to avoid probate. Um, even if you have jointly titled property, it goes to the other person. But then if that person never um, puts their property in a trust, then it's going through probate one way or another. So, or if something happens to both parties at the same time. So probate avoidance, I think, is the biggest um, advantage in putting real estate into a trust. Um, disadvantages. So some lenders, and I don't understand this, but some lenders, when you do a refinance, they want you to take it out of the trust and then to do the refinance and then put it back in. Mm -hmm. I have kind of been told that it's because of paperwork and it makes no sense to me, but as long as the settlement company does it right, it's fine. Because if it's not in the trust for like, because let's be real, they're not going to record the deed. Like it's, it's like silly, but it happens. So it might just be an extra step, but I don't see a lot of disadvantages for a trust. Okay. Honestly. In that situation, does it involve extra time and money to do it that way? I imagine it would. It depends on the, the settlement company, honestly. Like again, if they have if they have if they know what they're doing, they're the ones preparing the deeds. So a good settlement company is going to prepare two deeds and they're going to do one taking it out of the trust, complete the transaction, and then they'll already have one prepared for putting it back in the trust. And then they just get recorded, you know, kind of back to back. 
if you don't have a good settlement company, it could complicate things. And I do get, I do get calls from time to time saying they want me to do this. Can you help? And I've, I have done that for clients. And then of course I have to charge them additional fees, but just depends. Okay. All right. So Laura Nash, let's move to you and let's talk about comprehensive financial planning. What exactly does that entail? Sure. So what it entails is putting your arms around all of your financial assets. So it's looking at what your assets and liabilities are, what do you have and what do you owe? It's also looking at your income, whether it's social security, a pension, a rental um, real estate, or any other types of income, and looking at your expenses. What are you spending your money on? And it's always helpful as well to break up your expenses into what are my needs, um, and then what are my wants? so that you also have a better idea of where your money's going. Um, and if you needed to cut back on anything, you'd have a better sense of what those areas may be. So once we have all of that information, we can then put those pieces together to look at your full financial picture. For instance, we recently met with someone who is retired. Um, they did a plan four years ago. They had expected to live on social security and their pension, but they've been pulling money out on a yearly basis to pay for their grandchild's uh, preschool education. And so they were a little concerned about how will this affect my finances long-term if I am taking this extra amount out on a yearly basis. So we were able to look at some different scenarios um, as well as long-term care. Um, to see what the potential effect could be on their finances so they would have more information to be able to determine should I continue paying for my grandchild's education or are there other changes I need to make because what was important to them was having enough money to last their lifetime and these days with people living longer we're typically planning out to the age of 95 or 100. So right. even if someone says, oh no, you know, my uh, relatives did not live that long, we always want to look at the worst case scenarios. Even if it doesn't feel good, we want to be prepared. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so let's see. Issues to consider post-retirement, gifting, investments later in life. And, and another thing, um, you know, when you're when you're considering liquidating assets, if you get to the point where you need to liquidate assets to move into a senior community, for instance, what are, you know, what should you sell first? That kind of thing. Well, hopefully you have someone who can advise you because it's different for everyone's situation. And I've seen people take money out of accounts where if they selected a different account, they would have had a lower tax liability, for instance. So things to consider is, you know, everyone's situation is different. They may want to look at what assets are the easiest to liquidate, right? Savings in a bank might be easier than selling a stock. Um, so looking at ease of liquidation and also looking at tax considerations, um, selling some assets may have a higher tax liability than something else. So that's also important to take a look at when you're liquidating um, assets. Um, can we talk a little bit about capital gains and how that plays into this? Certainly. So especially when selling a home, we see many people um, as they get older, they may be in the same home um, that they've lived in for 30 or 40 years, which means the profit now on that home is quite substantial. So something to keep in mind when it comes to capital gains taxes is that if you've lived in your primary residence for over two years, you're exempt from any taxes on a profit of 500,000 for a married couple and 250,000 for um, an individual or a single person. Anything above that amount, you will have to pay capital gains taxes on. And depending on what your income is, 
you know, the highest amount would be 20%. Um, so that is definitely something to consider, especially for people who've lived in their homes for a long time. Uh, one point that I did want to make is that if you're married and your partner, your spouse passes away, if you sell your home within two years of their passing, you would still qualify for the married exemption. Oh, so, oh, wow. That's huge. Yes. Yes. Wow. Did not know so, that. <laughs> yes. You know, so, be within two years. Um, and then if you would qualify for the 500,000 exemption versus the 250,000, which could be sizable for someone who may have bought their home again, you know, 40 or more years ago. Mm -hmm. So something to keep in mind. Um, Laura, one, one question that often comes up to us as realtors is, yeah, we did buy our house 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, it's doubled in price, but we also have done a lot of renovations. To the house and you know i always refer them to their accountant because i you know i don't know that level of detail but are there certain high level things we can always say like oh if you did this like a new roof or a new kitchen like you know some things that defray you know or help with that capital gains right so it's a great question laura and it is a question for an accountant as far as what capital improvements you could mm -hmm. potentially write off, or they may have already written off those improvements. Oh, so I would sure. definitely yeah. talk to an accountant specifically about that. Okay. And that's usually what we say, but I just, yeah. I'm just curious because um, yeah. it comes up so often because in this particular region that we live in, if you've lived in your home for quite a while, your value has gone up significantly. Absolutely. All right, let's see. Um, we haven't paused for questions yet. Uh, we've been on a roll here. Does anybody have any questions at all? Uh, chat or raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Feel free to ask away. And if not, I think we will continue on. Let's see, we talked about the homestead exemption. Well, we didn't talk about the homestead exemption. Is that something people should be thinking about, Laura Nash? If you go to the yeah. next slide, Jen, it's. Whoops. Yes. There, there you we go. go. <laughs> so, yes, hopefully um, everyone is taking their homestead exemption. If um, you're not sure, you can look at your property tax bill. You can also reach out to the state um, property tax office in Maryland. It's the Department of Assessment and Taxation. One other thing I wanted to note was the homestead exemption reduces your property tax that you owe. And in Maryland, for people that are over 65, you can look into the homeowner's tax credit application for any type of further reduction um, if you're over 65. So definitely something to look into. Are there income limits on that? There's no income limits on the homestead exemption, and I am not positive about the homeowner's tax credit for those over 65. Okay, thank you. All right, so actions you can take now. Anybody, jump in. What would you recommend people think about doing if they haven't put any of this in, into place yet? I can start if that's all right with you, ladies. Yes. Um, I think that the first thing is really just having a conversation with yourself and then also with the people that are important to you in your life and people that you trust. Um, we all need to have mentors, counselors, people to bounce ideas off of. And I think that until we start um, talking about these things with each other, um, we can't really get any of this done. So just starting that conversation, starting to talk about What's your plan for the future? How is it going to happen? What is it that you want? I think it's really easy for us to have this generic idea in our minds. Like, yeah, I have a plan and it's like for retirement or I have a plan to transfer things to my children or I have an idea of what I want. But when you really get into the details, you realize that it takes a lot of planning and it takes a lot of um, research and trust and making sure that you have people in your circle. And so creating a team with 
different professionals that have aspects of these different parts of the circle is just a great place to start. So it can be overwhelming, but the best place to start is just having a conversation about what you want and then contacting whoever it is you feel comfortable with first and making sure you're in connection with everyone that you need on your team. Yeah. And I guess I would add, you know, most people get information from referrals from friends and family. So certainly if you already have a uh, professional advising you in one area of your life, ask them for recommendations to others who can fill out that team. Yeah, what? definitely built up of the, the trust concept. I think that when you trust somebody, you're, you trust them to give you a good referral. So that's definitely good advice. One thing I want to add too, is I, I think this is as many situations come up in life, a situation where a lot of us get paralyzed because we, we don't know what we don't know, right? And so we get nervous. So like, so the, the key to success is get over that and find someone to talk to to ask these questions. You know, you can do internet research all you want and there's websites, but you really want a trusted professional that you feel comfortable with, to your point, Antonia, trust to ask the questions that you might feel embarrassed to ask because you think you should know at this point in your lives, these kind of things, so. And to, to go along with that, I'd say get find out what's out there. Start redoing some research. Um, a lot of professionals do these types of webinars or seminars, or they have videos on their websites or whatever, where you can just start learning about kind of the different aspects of what's involved. And we hear a lot, oh, it's so, you know, aside from, I don't want to think about what happens when I die. Um, right. It's overwhelming. It's complicated. So just pick one area and just start learning a little bit about it and attend webinars, read articles, whatever, you know, your medium is. And then once you kind of have an idea of, you know, what's out there, you'll start to kind of find people that you trust to work with and then take one step, you know, take one step to get one thing done and, and then eventually it'll, it'll be done. This is all great advice. And one thing that I wanted to share was every, you know, person or client I meet with, I always talk first about having an estate plan in place. Because one thing to bear in mind is if you don't have a plan in place, the government has a plan in place for you. And it may not be exactly what you want. So that is something to, to bear in mind. And again, as everyone else shared, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, we're all here to help. We want to help. Um, and we want to help you ask the questions that you also may not be thinking about. And I think it's important to do this well in advance of when you need it. You, you know, you could be thinking about it in your 40s or 50s even, because you don't certainly don't want to wait until there's a crisis and have other people make the decisions for you, right? And it's a legacy you can leave for your family as well to be prepared. So, so thank you, Lindsay Warrens, Antonia Cummings, and Laura Nash for being a part of this seminar. I hope the attendees found it uh, beneficial. We do have a link to an evaluation in the chat if you wouldn't mind filling that out. We love feedback on our seminars. Uh, we do these on a regular basis on different topics, as I mentioned. You can find our schedule on our website at capitalseniorsolutions.com on the seminars page. And uh, for those of you who might be interested, we also have a free monthly downsizers club. This is a smaller support group that meets on Zoom once a month, and it's for people who could be one to five years away from making any kind of decision on when and if to move. It could be even people who are considering aging in place. Uh, but we have a lot of fun with it, and the dates for that are also on our, our website at CapitalSeniorSolutions.com. So... If there are no further questions, this has been recorded. You can find it on our website in the video library. And again, thank you everyone for being here. Any final comments from any of the participants or any of the panelists? Thanks for thank having you. us, Jan and Laura. Very grateful, thank you. Thank you All right, well, everybody have a wonderful day. Thanks, bye. Take care, bye. bye.